Dr. Pierce, the first question is uh, from David. Should we start looking at controlling at the overwintering stage of the weevil? Is there any information or any thoughts on that? Uh, I don't think we know enough to uh, consider that at the moment. You know, several of us have mentioned that uh, there's an open question as to whether or not the weevils leave the field during the winter. And the uh, second open question, I think, is whether or not you can get uh, reasonable insecticide efficacy at those very low temperatures. And I think that's uh, those are two concerns that I think you would need to address before uh, having that uh, considered to be a practical approach. Great. Does anybody else have some thoughts on that? There was some uh, really, the overwintering question is really interesting. And there's some really interesting stuff. I think it was the 40s and the 50s where the USDA had done some research. Um, and if I recall correctly from their reports, uh, there'd be a certain number that would leave the field, a certain number that would stay inside the field. So I'm pretty sure they're overwintering uh, in both areas, but I kind of wonder if it relates to how much residue and overwintering areas there are in an alfalfa field. You know, if the field's really clean, you've got the crown that's protected, but other than the crown. So, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Great. Thank you, Dr. Warner. Uh, anybody else? Great. We have a, a comment for you, Dr. Pierce. It comes from Scott Shell. He says, congratulations on your retirement and thanks for the presentation. Okay, we got another question. We're going to jump back to, to Micah's presentation. There was a question, are ladybugs effective against weevils? And if so, how many uh, ladybugs? Is there a threshold that, that provides good control? That is a great question. Um, I don't know personally. Um, somebody else might know what the actual ladybug threshold is for that. Um, I do know, though, that lady beetles do prey or predate on alfalfa weevil larvae. I just don't know to what extent. So I said maybe somebody else might be able to answer that if they know. I'll just quickly say, I mean, I'm curious to see what uh, other people would add, but um, I know that there's been work done in Montana and Utah where they weren't able, you know, using exclosures and stuff to really detect a big contribution of lady beetles against um, alfalfa weevil compared to the parasitoids. Um, but, and then it seems like the lady beetles are probably more likely feeding on aphids or things that might be a little easier for them to to get at. Um, but that said, you know, I think even though I think that lady beetles must eat some of those early instar larvae, I just don't think we know if that is a big enough contribution. So far, it doesn't seem like it's a big enough contribution compared to the wasps. Um, and so I don't think there are any thresholds in terms of weevils. I think it's more like they're probably eating more of the aphids. Um, and so that's kind of what I would say, but I don't know, but I think we've all spent so much time in the field. I remember for Judith's project, we'd be looking, you know, at the ground so carefully for those post-harvest or for those, you know, when we were collecting stuff, we wanted to make sure we pick everything up. And I definitely saw like an ant drag away a tiny, you know, an early instar weevil larvae, those small ones. And so I just watched it with my eyes. And so I do think those predators are doing something. It just might be hard for us to capture how big of a con contribution it is. Anybody else have a, a thought or comment or observations they've seen? I have right. a question for uh, Frank and Renda. So do you think with the early sprays that were effective, do you think they're, you know, with your weather, were you going from quite cool to quite warm? Do you think there was a synchronization of the adult movement into the field? Um, and I don't know a lot about persistence of pyrethroids, but I have always thought seven to 10 days of good persistence, maybe there's some around longer, but you know, good lethal persistence might be seven to 10 days. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. 
Frank, you want to go first? Because you've been looking at it longer than us. I have a few years uh, of data. But, but I have to tell you that, uh, you know, these, uh, that, uh, that slide that I showed you summarizes some really pretty empirical data. I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, we arbitrarily picked a, you know, a treatment time and started spraying and it worked and don't really know much more than that. As far as the residual effectiveness, I would expect it to be a little bit longer uh, in these early treatments just because of the lower temperatures. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it all goes back to this, uh, the question of uh, where, where they're spending the winter. You know, if they read yeah. the book, yeah. if they read the book, they're leaving the field, but I don't think they all read the book. So. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't think I did a good job of clearly connecting this, but the reason that we've been able to nest Micah's stuff within this project with um, Kim Hageman, the chemist, is because that is the hypothesis that these, for us, it, it is quite a bit colder when we're doing the early application. And so we hypothesize that that means that efficacy is going to last longer. Um, and so this coming summer, in addition to everything he already did, Mike is going to be collecting leaf samples at like different times um, over kind of a one week window and sending them to Kim's chemistry lab so that we can actually see are these curves different in the early timing than the regular timing? And do we think that's kind of an example of cold temperature allowing that to happen. Um, so that's something we're hoping to pin down a little bit better. Cause I would say, at least in our experience, it is quite a bit different. Those weather conditions are really quite a bit different. Great, we have a comment uh, from Scott Shell. Uh, this is more of a comment. He says, I have seen fields used for cattle winter pasture with little alfalfa weevil spring activity initially due, I think to trampling probably hard on the alfalfa plant, especially the longer that is uh, drug into the springtime. But any observations or thoughts there that you guys have seen? No, but I believe there's uh, some work that had, was done in Oklahoma where they looked at, uh, looked at grazing uh, alfalfa impact on, on alfalfa weevil. And you know, it's, it's similar to small grains that, you know, there is mortality due to consumption and mortality due to trampling, but the main consideration is uh, uh, kind of balancing crop crop damage against the suppression that you get of the pest insect. Great, thank you. Yeah, Jenny, uh, if you would please bring Scott Shell up too, as well as a, as a host. I forgot about that. I apologize. Thanks for prompting me on that. Um, Scott Shell is an entomologist with UW Extension, and uh, he was a big proponent in helping put this seminar together. So we're going to bring him up and, and hopefully collect his thoughts. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, we have a question for the group. The old, uh, this comes from David, and the question is, old timers used to drag their field the first day it hit 50 degrees. Is this any help in controlling the bugs? For me personally, I've also had this question asked from clientele saying, after first harvest, should I drag my fields? Is there any control of, of weevil for second? I think that one's wide open. So anybody that has thoughts on it, that's a hot potato, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think, I've also heard the same thing, like harrowing or dragging at different times and having like some dust come up and, and that, you know, I think any of these physical, more physical methods of, of control, I don't think we know as much about, um, to be honest, from a science perspective. And so I think in general, like if people think that grazing is helping or that harrowing is helping, I think it depends a lot on the timing of when you're doing it. People have mentioned weather. I think it depends, like, is it a hotter, drier time when maybe you're dusting these things up and they're like exposed. Um, so I think there's definitely potential for that to contribute, even though I don't think it's necessarily been explored by scientists in a lot of detail. I think just in general, these more physical methods, um, we just haven't done as much on it. But I think there's a lot of room for that. I think I've heard that repeatedly from people. I think there's some, you know, there's probably something to it. I, you know, that's what I would say. Well, 
you know, and, and I think someone, one of the speakers earlier mentioned that, you know, when it comes to alfalfa weevil, it can be kind of complicated with their behavior, the different weather patterns, the different climates, the different regions. Um, and on the cultural, a lot of those cultural methods, yeah, I don't think we have enough information. We hear stories, but I have to relate this story that I heard from Alberta, where um, they developed resistance in seed alfalfa to pyrethroids. And I was talking to the fellow and he said, well, you know, they're trying all sorts of different cultural things. So burning, because I get this question a few times. And he said, well, they tried it. And he said, you could see the adult, it was early, it was early. You could see the adult weevils flying out. And then when the field greened up again, you could see them fly back in. Now that's just a story, but um, yeah, I think it's uh, with some of the cultural techniques, it, 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 it might, might be complicated, I don't know. I, my response back to, to folks is I don't have any evidence showing that it is effective, right? And especially if we're talking a chain harrow, you know, you just have those tines there and there's not much physical surface area being covered on the field. And so I think it would be minimal, but we have no, no antidote. Uh, that's all anecdotal, right? There, there's no data supporting it one way or another. Um, and I was thinking maybe a roller harrow. I, I know some roller harrow that field instead of a chain drag, uh, but that would implement maybe possibly more crushing activity and you may see more uh, control if there was one. But again, that's all anecdotal. There's no data supporting it. So it, it is a question. That's interesting. Uh, uh, Scott Shell, do you have a, uh, Rinda was wondering, do you have a comment? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna pull up my chat, I dropped it. Uh, do you have a comment on the, the question about blister beetles? Do you have any perspective on that question that was posed before? And if you need the question again, Scott, I can try and find it in the Q&A box. Yeah, if, if you could uh, uh, refresh my memory, because it, it had something to do with the treatment and impact on blister beetle populations, is that right? Right. Um, let me let me look here. So in, in general, the blister beetles are not attracted to the alfalfa field until you have bloom occurring, uh, which in many cases, you know, the to the harvest for high protein content, you avoid that. Uh, in and in Wyoming, uh, just in general, uh, the most common blister beetle that we've had problems with is the black blister beetle, which population seems to peak later in the summer when you're kind of past the alfalfa weevil season. But, uh, uh, you, you know, so uh, it was kind of a comment. It says, in growing alfalfa in both Colorado and Wyoming, I found that early harvest did little to control the entry of blister beetles, especially if the neighbor did not control. The application of insecticide allowed the control, uh, the control of both the larval uh, blister beetle issue and the controlled beetle losses into the third cutting. Did you track blister beetle population was the original question. Thank you, Jenny. I was having a hard time finding it. Yeah, I guess uh, I'll, I'll let the other people with their observations too. But again, except for what, from what I've seen, you know, the, the blister beetles are only uh, moving into the field. Uh, you know, they, the species that are problematic in the genus Epicotta, uh, they swarm uh, on blooming plants. And, and one of the things about that would be, uh, you know, if your alfalfa is not blooming, then you probably are not going to have that issue during harvest. It's only when you allow it to go to full bloom uh, that that would be apparent. Is that what other folks see? I, I'd add a comment that, uh, at least in the case of uh, Pennsylvania, which Scott's mentioning, uh, that's a very low toxicity beetle relative to the others in terms of cantharidin content. And also it uh, is not one of the uh, swarming species. So both of those factors really reduce the risk to horses and uh, hay contamination. So uh, at least here, the, the only one we really worry about is uh, Lemniscata, you know, the striped blister beetle, because that is a swarmer and it's also very high in cantharidin content but we don't see too much of that up here. It's more 
more of an Arkansas Valley issue. Yeah, we uh, never had the striped blister beetle collected in Wyoming. Uh, uh, South Dakota is kind of a, uh, apparently you know, northern limit. And of course, there's no geographic barrier from South Dakota to North Dakota into eastern Wyoming. But again, we never had it uh, collected uh, or, or any observations of it. Um, so yeah, it's generally the two gray species or the black ones that we uh, will see in uh, association with fields occasionally. And from what I'm hearing, Scott, um, usually our alfalfa weevil insecticide applications may not coincide with their presence in the field. And so if we're making that application before bloom, before the attractant of those beetles coming in, we're not seeing an overlap. They're basically of our control method. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think it uh, has any impact on them. It's very interesting, uh, uh, Frank's observations on the P. aphids, uh, uh, you know, where it's a kind of a release from the predators caused by the pesticide application for alfalfa weevil, you know, non-target impact releasing them. And, and I know uh, in there, uh, uh, concern about a different P or uh, different aphid in the bighorn basin, uh, uh, but I, I, uh, I'm not an aphid person, so I, I didn't keep track of it very well. Yeah, uh, I, I believe it, it was in alfalfa seed uh, fields, and I believe it was the spotted aphid. Uh, it was the concern there as well. So, yep. All right, guys. Uh, does anybody else have any last thoughts or anything that we didn't cover? I mean, man, we, it seems like we did a good job covering the topic, but there's always more, but I don't see any other questions in the chat box or Q and a box, but any other last resounding thoughts or comments before we, we close out the webinar? I, I just, I really appreciated it. Uh, all the presentations it, it really helped bring it together. I was uh, taking pictures of the screen. I hope you don't mind because I can't remember or take notes as fast as, as some, but I really appreciate uh, the presentations and the information shared. It's such an important crop for Wyoming and the region, you know, and, and definitely uh, alfalfa will become more problematic. So again, thanks a lot to everybody that participated. Those are great comments, Scott. I feel the same way. Thank you so much for uh, one, our participants for joining us. Uh, again, like I said, this was kind of an experimental trial run. We're, we're kind of dabbling with this uh, hybrid model and that, and it, it seems very successful, very pleased with it. So, and thank you so much for the interaction, not, uh, not being hesitant to jump in there and ask us questions. That's why we're doing this is to help you and help everyone out out there. Um, and so with that, uh, I just wanted to mention in terms of uh, Scott's uh, comments there, uh, we have recorded these. Hopefully it came through well. It just depends on how good we did. We're hoping to, to break this webinar up into the individual presentations, and then we will post those recorded sessions back up uh, on, a, on a website. Uh, with UW. And so then I will be also sending those uh, a link to those recorded. It'll be on YouTube. So we'll send that out. We'll make it open to the public so people can search and find that on YouTube. Uh, but we're going to get that back out there best you can. If you can't find it, I know how it is in the virtual world. Give me a call. Shoot me an email. I will connect you physically with it uh, that way. But that's our, our hopes to get it to you. Again, please, uh, we're going to uh, be watching your emails. We'll be trying to email out an evaluation to everybody, and we'd really like to hear feedback from everyone. Uh, that's why we do this, and, and it helps getting that input and feedback from you to help us steer this. But with that, thank you so much. You guys have a good rest of your day um, and, and enjoy the rest of the week. And at least here in the Bighorn Basin, we're starting to warm up and hit the 40s and 50s. So it's looking like farming season already. So you guys take care. We'll talk to you soon.